Boy, this. Okay. All right. So we'll, you've probably, I mean, you've done this a ton of times, so I don't know if you've listened to my show or not, but it's pretty much the same thing as everything else you hear. It's just a simple interview, and I definitely want to talk about um, what got you into it, because believe it or not, I mean, my, my listeners are a little bit different than Wes's listeners and Cliff and Bobo and all, all the other people. I mean, th so this, uh, literally, there'll be some people that have heard you for the first time, so I hope so. <laughs> I don't, I don't ever think anybody's heard me before. So well, it's, that's it's not a weird. It's a weird concept to me, <laughs> but now I have watched your show and I really like it. So awesome. Well, I'm going away. Let, let me stop my dog from barking. Hold on. He can come. Sorry, I'm a professional, I promise. It's fine. What kind of dog is it? Uh, he's a little, he's a rescue, like little uh -huh. mud. Probably, closest thing's probably a Jack Russell. Oh, cute. Yeah, he's, he's dead. I love dogs. Yeah, we, uh, we lost his brother. Something weird happened a couple of, probably about six months ago. His brother got killed here on the property and we had no. it. I don't know if it was, he got attacked and he showed up at the porch bleeding and it was. So sad. It was horrible. Ooh. Great story to tell before we do the show, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, it's sad. <laughs> All right. I lost so, my cat about a month ago, so I hear you. I know it's it's people don't realize we don't have any kids. Our our dogs and our animals are our kids. So of course, mine still. I have one daughter, but my babies are still my cats too. And I whoops, I used to have dogs. I love dogs. Someday I'm gonna get a dog. I've never had a dog of my own. Mm just you know growing up all right so we'll do the pause and then we'll just interact and this is uh, the video I, I put out for the members so it's it's not a ton of people that's going to see the video it's it's okay. basically for them and the the video or the audio will be put out for the the regular show so all right we'll pause here in a second and i'll bring you on and we can interact and then we'll just go from there okay sounds good ready to roll yep all right here we go <clears throat> all right i want to welcome our guest tonight it is amy boo welcome to the show amy thank you so much i'm happy to be here i am super excited to have you i know we had this scheduled a while back and we had to cancel it and i'm glad that our schedules aligned that we could get you back on the show because i've been excited to talk to you so i know a lot of people know who amy boo is but for those in the audience who aren't familiar with you we just just sort of give us a breakdown of who Amy is and what got you interested in this Bigfoot thing that that you've been doing for a while now. Absolutely. So I am from Ohio, from Youngstown, Ohio. Moved to Cleveland for a while, but I'm back in town again. And I am a teacher teaching kindergarten this year, which is why I have these dark circles under my eyes. <laughs> I've never taught kindergarten before, so it's been it's been kicking my butt, but in a good way. I love them. Um, I'm also a writer and an editor, and I am very much interested in Bigfoot. And the way that I got interested, you know, it was not really on my radar until about 2012. I mean, I knew what, I mean, I knew what Bigfoot was like supposed to be. I saw In Search Of, and I saw Harry and the Henderson. So, you know, I wasn't totally like clueless about that there was this story about Bigfoot but I really thought it was just a story back then. And if at any time I would have thought it wasn't, which that is, there was no time, but pretend, <laughs> I would have never thought it would be in Ohio, you know, um, just, and, and still, even to this day, even though I live here, I take reports here a lot, I still think it's really weird. But um, what got me interested and kind of sent down the rabbit hole of Bigfoot <laughs> research is, in 2012, I was a passenger in a car, and if there's a big crash, my cat is about to jump up on here, but um, <laughs> stay away, cat, but um, 
I was a passenger. So I was looking out the window and we were driving over the Meander Reservoir Bridge that is like 76 goes straight, 80, you know, the turnpike goes off to the right, which you probably don't know, but if anybody's from around here, they would know. And what's really weird about this is this is the city's water supply. So all the hundreds, if not thousands of times I had been over this bridge, never even saw a person in there, especially since 9-11, because then it was governed by Homeland Security. And you're not allowed in there. I mean, everybody in town wants to go in there and go fishing and stuff, but you're not allowed. So um, we were driving along, I'm looking out the window and I saw these birds flying around um, and the birds are always there, they're cormorants and they usually are sitting on these cement blocks that are in the water. And I'm, but them flying so much drew my attention over there. And the one that was closest to the shore is where they were really, you know, flying around in a ruckus and it drew my attention to the shore. So I look over at the shore and we're going a pretty good clip over the bridge. I'm, I'm not exactly sure, you know, depending on traffic, how fast we were going, but I look over and I see a big figure and people ask me if I've ever seen a Sasquatch. And I always say, I don't know because even at the closest point where we were parallel to this, it was still about a hundred yards away. So I'm not sure, but what I thought when I looked at it and I'm looking and looking and I didn't say anything because I was just so taken aback. I'm looking and we're getting closer to and closer to it is that it looked like Bigfoot. Cause again, you know, I had seen, you know in pop culture, Bigfoot stuff. That's what it looked like. It was all uniform in color. It was definitely alive and not like a fake something because it moved, it was holding onto a tree and it seemed to be facing those same birds that I had been looking at. And so as we're driving past it, I'm just like, what in the world, you know, in my head and we're zooming past it. And I'm like, I think I just saw Bigfoot. And my ex-husband was like, okay. <laughs> and my daughter was in the back seat on her iPod, which is how long ago it was. And nobody else saw it. And of course I really wanted to go back, but you can't just stop and go back there and it's all fenced in. So I don't know what it was that I saw that day, but it was very large. Again, I never saw a person in there. It didn't look like a person. And I, I am 100% sure it was not a black bear. Now we do get them in the area once in a while. And I see them a lot when I'm out in Pennsylvania and the Alleghenies and Cook Forest and stuff like that. You, you see black bear. I know their stance. I know what a bear would look like, even at that distance. That's not what it, I, I'm positive. That's not what it was. Um, but whatever that was that I saw, that's what drew me into this topic because I called my mom right away. I'm like, mom, I think I just saw Bigfoot. Ha ha ha. She's like, of course you did. <laughs> She's very supportive. And um, I started when we got back home, even like within that week, if not that day, I don't think that day, but within that week, I started looking into Bigfoot. And I very quickly found out that I was not the only one to see one. You know, I, I just thought it was crazy. I thought this is stupid. It couldn't be that. But I wasn't the only one to see one in that area. So then I was like, oh my gosh, like what's, even if I was going to find out that there's some really tall, very large, wide guy going around pretending he's Bigfoot, I'm like, that's interesting. So I want to find out. But after all these years, I really don't think that's the case. And although I can't call myself a Bigfoot believer, exactly, depending on the day, I'm pretty sure that they exist. You know, I mean, you're probably the same way that some days you're like, uh, I'm never going to see one and maybe they're not real. But um, that's what that's what drew me into this field, no matter what that was. Yeah, and I think that's one of the most interesting things about doing this kind of work and, and doing this kind of research is, like you said, there's plenty of days that m more recently than, than seven, eight, 10 months ago, maybe a couple of years ago, that I just have days where I'm like, is the, any of this real? You know, you, you talk yeah. to so many people, and I, I certainly want to get into some of the accounts and some of the reports that you've taken, but 
when you talk to so many people like I do, and I hear so many incredible stories, it drives me on to, to reach those answers. And I've said it on the show so many times that I'm not doing the show or I don't do this to prove that anything exists to anybody. I'm searching for those answers myself because I've had experiences in my life that I can't explain. So I'm constantly searching for those answers. And that's always my answer to that question is, you know, are you trying to prove that Bigfoot's real or are you trying to prove that they, they exist? No, I'm not. I'm trying to find answers for myself to explain some of the experiences I've had. But that's the thing about this phenomenon, right? Because we know the phenomenon exists. No matter what happens or, or what's ever found out about this thing in the end of the day or at the end of the day, the phenomenon itself exists. And sometimes that's enough to drive me forward, even on those days where I'm like, if I hear one more incredible story that couldn't possibly be real, I'm just going to hang it up. But I keep going because the, the phenomenon is in and of itself enough to drive me on to look for those answers. So agreed. Me too. Having that experience and being able to say, well, I saw something, but I don't know what it is. And being able to sort of throw yourself into the research. I know you have experiences of your own, but I know you've taken other encounters and you've experienced the investigation of somebody else's encounter. Why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the more interesting stories that you've heard from people and some of the interesting encounters that you've actually been able to investigate? Sure. Yeah, that's one of my favorite parts of this is talking to other people. And I always say, you know, there's this wide spectrum of what people think Bigfoot could be. And I'm definitely, my interest is, is there an undocumented or unproven primate running around in North America. That's what I'm interested in. I don't claim to know, you know, and I don't, if, if it does exist, it doesn't have to be that. That's just my interest. And so I take reports from people all across that spectrum. So, you know, you have people who think maybe it's more an alien or paranormal or something like that. I don't make fun of people because I don't know, you know, I, I don't know what it is, but my favorites have always been reports where it certainly seems like it could be some type of a primate, whether that's closer to a chimpanzee or whether it's closer to a human, I don't know, but it seems like a real natural creature. So um, some of the stories, you know, like you said, I that's what keeps me going. It really does because no matter how like burned out I get with it or, um, you know, if I do get something that just seems like too good to be true, and then you find out it's a hoax, and believe me, I know a lot of hoaxers, and I've um, caught people hoaxing before, you know, every once in a while, you get a story that you just can't shake. You cannot get it out of your head, and um, I used to be an investigator for the BFRO. I decided to go do my own thing, um, it wasn't too long after that, like within a day, I think that I was asked to be a member of the Olympic project, um, which I'm still excited about. And I, I never can believe I can say that because I just admire what they're doing so much. But I, um, you know, when I'm out in the Pacific Northwest, I do things with them, but mostly I'm here in Ohio and a, a lot of my research is in Pennsylvania. So I'm just setting up the backstory there. Um, so I did take some really fascinating reports when I was in the BFRO, but my favorite things that I do now, um, I go to hunting and fishing shows. I was um, asked to do one for a friend who wasn't able to go. And I was like, okay, you know, because I mean, at this point, I don't really care if people think I'm crazy or not. But I remember the first time I did that, I was like, man, these people are going to eat me alive or throw tomatoes or something. <laughs> you know because like here I am this lady I don't look like I would be into Bigfoot I look probably like the kindergarten teacher that I am right now and I am sitting well first of all I get there the night before this fishing hunting and fishing show um, outside of Pittsburgh Pennsylvania it's a big show and I'm like taping down the carpet in the booth that I'm supposed to be in and I'm getting everything ready and I look up and there's these I don't remember, like five or six guys that are standing there, you know, in their camo and 
hunting gear and all this stuff. And I'm like, what's going on? And it ended up that even that night, they were people from other booths. And these were, had nothing to do with Bigfoot, but these, every single one of those guys had a story and they're like, oh, this is cool. Cause they saw my Bigfoot poster that was hanging up or whatever you call it. And they all had stories for me. And I'm like, oh, maybe this isn't going to be so bad. So I'll tell you what, I get so many stories that way or encounters. I call them stories. When I say that, I don't mean that they're made up. You know what I mean? Um, people telling me what happened to them between two different um, outdoor shows that I did last year, just two, one in Ohio and one in Pennsylvania, I got 87 new reports. And I'm just so flabbergasted by that amount, but people kind of come out of the woodwork. And you get some people that are like, oh, whatever, and, you know, but I, like I said, I don't care, but you get these people, these mostly men, you know, there's some ladies out there hunting and stuff, um, but mostly men and they'll kind of come past the table and they'll look at it and then they'll kind of walk away and some of them will come back slowly when their buddies aren't there and they'll start telling me their stories and one of them and you kind of had to be there to get the full impact but I'll never forget this gentleman he was an older gentleman he comes up to me and my friend Tina who's like my research partner kind of lady and um, we were talking to him and he was very emotional like the emotional stories are what catch my eye because I know people lie to me and I again I, I know there are hoaxes but when somebody's telling you something and they are shook up over it it's a little harder to just dismiss it so he was you know he didn't want to talk at first and then he's like listen I'm going to tell you about this and he said he had never told anybody about what happened to him and, or maybe like a family member or something. I can't remember. My brain doesn't work very well sometimes, <laughs> but he said, it's not something that he made, you know, public knowledge, but he had been in his own home, which was out in the country, like on a farm, looking out the window. And he says he saw a Sasquatch standing there looking toward the house. And it didn't do anything. It's not like the most exciting story ever. Like it didn't try to hurt him. It didn't do anything, but it was standing there. And he, this man is like getting shook up. And he said, I used to love to hunt. I used to go every year. And the opening day of deer season was my Christmas. And I went to all these shows and I bought all the stuff, you know, the equipment. And it was just the best thing ever. And he said, after he saw that, he's never gone back in the woods. He, said he won't go because he, doesn't know what could be out there and the farm was close to the woods where he would hunt and he said I just you know that thing wasn't supposed to exist I don't I don't want to go I don't want to see another one you know and a lot of times when you get people say things like that you wonder why are you out there <laughs> traipsing around trying to see one but um you know, he was 100% serious and he, you know, lifelong hunter, he said he started hunting when he was a little boy. He's not going to mistake a bear for that. Um, but he, he's claimed that it existed. Another one that I really, um, I tell this one a lot, but I just, I can't shake this one either. There was a guy who was a foreman for his construction crew in the um, area of Cook Forest, not right in Cook Forest, but near there in Pennsylvania. And he said that he was, he had volunteered to be the overnight person because they were trying to melt the water in a small water tower because they wanted to take it down. And he said he was in his truck and had the truck off so it didn't waste all the gas and stuff. But this was in February. So he had blankets and sleeping bags and stuff all, you know, cocooned inside the truck. And every half hour he had his, on his phone, his um, alarm to go off. So it would wake him up. He'd made sure that the generator was still going, the flame was still going, and then you know everything was good. So he said one time the before the alarm went off, he woke up because something had shoved the truck, like just like shook it so that it woke him up. And he was startled, and he's like trying to get out of the blankets and stuff, and he could hear something walking away. And so finally, you know he emerges from his cocoon and he looks toward the fire and the water tower and he saw something standing there 
And he's telling me this. Um, I went with my friend who's a bear specialist from Canada and we were interviewing him and his wife was there and his dog was there, which is important for later. <laughs> but he was telling us about how he's looking at this thing and he wanted to try to get a picture or just, you know, whatever he was, he moved to try to get his phone, which when he had, you know, jumped out of the blankets, it had knocked over to the passenger floor. And so he's like moving to try to get that. And he thinks that the, whatever it was, the Sasquatch, he said, saw some movement in the truck and turned to face him. And he was telling me just very shook up because he was telling me how wide it was. You know, it, it wasn't, I mean, it was tall, but he said the width of it was just crazy and he could see it very well in the light of that generator. And so at that point I could tell he was like a little bit upset. So I'm like, okay, why don't we do a reenactment? You know, like we try to do, you know, see how big we think it was. So I asked my bear specialist friend to walk over there and she's tall, a tall lady like over six foot, maybe around six foot. I'm not sure, but she walked toward where this was and it wasn't that far away. Um, so she walks and she goes to the tree and he had said that its head was near this one branch. So she walks there and turns to face us. And at that point, this gentleman who's just a normal guy, you know, just normal guy, he starts tearing up and is really upset. I mean, he wasn't like sobbing, but he was crying, you know, he was tearing up about it. So he got embarrassed because showing that emotion, you know, and he kind of went off to the side a little bit and I felt bad for him. And I started talking to his wife and I said, is he okay? You know, I'm sorry that he got upset. And she's like, no, it just really affected him. And she said, um, oh, I asked her, I said, do you remember like when this happened, did he tell you? Or she's like, oh my gosh, like he called me from his cell phone when he got, um, what do you call it when you, you get into the zone where you can use your phone? I just, the word escaped me, service, <laughs> service. And he called her and he, she said, she's never heard him so upset. And she's like, Amy, this man has never missed a day of work in his life. And he would not go to work for a few days, at least because he didn't want to go back to this area. Again, he's a hunter. He knows bears and he knows people. And he was like, this, that's not what it was. The most compelling thing of that whole interview is as he was getting more and more upset, especially when he was, you know, starting to cry and stuff, his dog was just going nuts. Like his dog was jumping up on him, you know, barking, just really upset. And what I remember about that was thinking that, you know, if this man is lying to me, he's doing a really really good job but I don't think he can lie to his dog like his dog would know that he wasn't really upset you know um so I was like man this this guy saw something this guy saw something and he was not into Bigfoot you know um not that not that I wouldn't believe somebody who was into Bigfoot but he just it wasn't his thing and and he swears that that's what he saw and I will never forget just that raw emotion that he had. So that was another one of my favorites. And that's one of the things that it's very difficult to convey to people, like doing what I do with the show. I talk to tons of people and I interview tons of people who share their stories. And that's one of the toughest things to convey is the emotion that goes into some of these accounts. Like you said, I know people have lied to me on the show. I'm sure there's people who have squeaked by me and there's probably shows out there that these po folks are probably had some sort of an encounter, but it's probably embellished and some of them may completely be made up. But there is that emotional feeling that you get. And, and I've often said it on the show, my BS meter is great. I usually have a really good BS meter and I can, I can tell if somebody's, you know, shooting me a line of crap. And that emotional feeling, especially on a raw, sometimes I'm, I'm getting encounters that have happened in the eighties, right. you know, some of them even farther back than that in the seventies, 
But recently I had, I think it was Randy on the show that had an encounter in Tennessee and it was like this past September and it was really fresh for him. And it took a ton for me to get him to come on and tell his story because it was so powerful for him. And like the story you just told, I think he stayed out of work for a couple of days because he just couldn't go back to work after having that encounter, because you're seeing this thing, A, that's not supposed to exist. And B, if you tell people that you've seen this thing that's not supposed to exist, there's that whole ridicule factor that comes along with it. So I, I say to people often, I'm very skeptical myself. You know, there's, there's a drinking game on the show now. Everybody's going to hear me say I'm skeptical. So everybody take a shot. I'm skeptical but, too. Go for it. Right, right. <laughs> so, and you have to be in this, right? You can't yeah, just you believe hook, line, hook, line, and sinker everything that people tell you. You have to approach it from a skeptical mind frame. And I'm a one-to-one -one correlation kind of person, right? You, you tell me you saw this. Well, great. Well, let's figure that out or let's go and take a look and see if that's possible kind of thing. But I don't discount anything. Like you said, those really out there stories that people tell me, maybe it's involving a, a UFO and seeing a Bigfoot. You know, I used to think, well, there's these weird stories that I'd hear about people seeing orbs and lights and things on their property and they have Bigfoot. And I used to separate the two and say, well, that's just a weird coincidence, right? I guess that they're having Bigfoot on their property and they're seeing these strange lights. But then I have somebody like Les Stroud on the show, you know, and Les talks about some of the things that he's experienced. And I just have to stop and think, well, maybe it is connected in some way. I mm -hmm. don't know. You it know, could be. Know. I mean, I always talk about when I hear something like that or people making fun of somebody, I always say, I, I refer to that movie, The Gods Must Be Crazy, when the pop bottle flies out of the plane and they're like oh it's from the gods because they don't know what it is and so maybe we just don't know what that science is just because we don't know how it works doesn't mean it's not scientific you know it doesn't mean it's not real so i i just think you know if if bigfoot's an alien that would be really cool <laughs> you know it's just not my it's not my interest but hey i i it wouldn't disappoint me Right. And that's a very good analogy, right? Because what happens to people that they don't understand often becomes science. Like mm -hmm. you said, the, 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 the Coke bottle flying yeah. out of the air, it's, it's just a Coke bottle to us. But if you've never experienced that, yeah. and, and I used to say that often people would say, they'd tell stories that seem like the woo and Bigfoot, yeah. right? Well, it yeah. disappeared. It was there and then it just disappeared or I felt like it cloaked well, maybe it just disappeared behind a tree because that's what they do. Yeah. You know, I was looking online literally today. I was scrolling Facebook. Once we got back from, we, we've been on a trip and we were up in um, South Carolina and we got back from our trip today and I was scrolling through Facebook and I see like this thing from Disney where this character is all in leaves and he's on stilts and he just, he's blending into this scene in Disney so he can scare people when they come by oh, yeah. I thought to myself. Of course, my brain immediately goes to Sasquatch and I'm thinking that's probably what Bigfoot does. And that's why it looks like they may be able to cloak, but it was a human being in a scene in Disney that was able to just blend into their environment. And I thought, wow, that's what people describe. And people as sort of associate that with the woo and Bigfoot saying, well, it just disappeared. Well, Maybe it didn't disappear. Maybe it yeah. Just maybe there's out. another explanation. Yeah, exactly. It didn't have to disappear into a portal. Maybe it just disappeared and blended into its environment. So, right. I don't know. It's just one of those fascinating things that just keeps me going forward and looking for more answers. Right. That's the fun right. part me of too. what we do. Yeah. I want to go into a little bit about. We've talked a little bit about the encounters that you've talked about, but you mentioned the Olympic project. And I just recently had the pleasure of interviewing Shane Corson for an upcoming show a couple of weeks ago. And Shane was phenomenal. And we talked he's about he's one of my best friends in, in the Bigfoot world. Absolutely. Guy. You know, I've met a ton of great people in the Bigfoot world. And I have to say, next to Matt Pruitt, I think Shane Corson is probably my second pay, favorite person that I've met in this this whole endeavor. He's great. 
I'm probably going to put somebody else right. in there, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it is what it is. So let's talk a little bit about the work that the Olympic Project's doing and what have you experienced? I know you've been to the NEST site. So for those of us who haven't gotten that experience, can you sort of tell us what that's like sort of coming in from the outside and going to that site? And, and what did you experience there? And what did you think about the overall experience that you had while you were at the NEST site? Sure. I mean, the last time I was there, when I was out in the PNW, I got to go with Shane. He was changing batteries and different, um, you know, recorders and stuff that were out there. And he looks back at me like I'm trudging through. He's like, you're really excited, aren't you? I'm like, this is better than Disneyland. <laughs> I remember saying that because it's just so cool. Um, I got the privilege of going to that nest site because I know a lot of people haven't been there because of my other project, Project Zoo Book, and two of my primate zoologists that helped me start that project. So I'm like slobbering on myself. Sorry. Sorry, mom. I had to say that. <laughs> but um, They were asked to go out and I just kind of got to tag along and I'm like, oh, yeah, you know. So we went out there and I'll tell you what, now I couldn't get right down to where the um, nest actually was so I'm up on a ledge looking down you know trying to trying to see stuff but um it's a long story I have a defect in my Achilles tendons and stuff so I just could not get down there and um but I was there so I got to just kind of be up in that area by myself while I was waiting for Shane and my two um zoo book scientists and Derek were going down so I'm just like looking around, waiting, like waiting for Bigfoot to come out. And it's just, first of all, it's so remote. Like you have, you have to know where you're going or have somebody take you there. You'll, you would never find it. You would never find it. Secondly, it's like on private land where you have to like have the key to get through these different gates and stuff if you're going to drive anywhere close to it. So you can get kind of close to it and then you have to hike in. So it's just, I always say, if this was a hoax, it's the stupidest hoax ever <laughs> because nobody was ever likely to find your hoax. You know, it's just, it's just so remote. Anyway, so we're out in that area and it's hard to walk through, um, you know, those huckleberry bushes, they're tall, they're everywhere and you have to like really make your way to get through there as I'm waiting for them to get up out of that actual you know nest site um looking around again I'm just, I'm just like oh man if, if Bigfoot's going to be anywhere this is where Bigfoot's going to be so um they came up and I and since you just interviewed Jane I'm assuming everybody knows about it and stuff so they came walking up out of that nest site and I just will never forget the look on my two friends' faces that had never been there before. They're interested in Bigfoot. Um, that's why our project started. Um, they've listened to a lot of podcasts. They've read a lot of things, but they haven't been out looking, you know, in the forest and stuff like a lot of us have. They were just flabbergasted. They were awestruck over what they saw. And they would tell you that um, the one gentleman, he is... Uh, in charge of gorillas at his zoo. And he also spent some time over in Africa. His um, oh, curator at his old zoo was one of the people that helped discover or rediscover, if you wanna say it, the Cross River gorillas. So like he's, he knows his stuff, okay? That's what I'll, all I'll say. Um, he was just like, I can't believe it. Like these, this really could be real. You know, and we talked about it, talking about it and being there is very different, but they were telling me about how the nests were set up, how they were made, looked very similar to like what their charges would do. Um, and he had seen nests over in Africa. So he was just like, like, this could, this could really be real. And I will never forget that because when I saw the looks on their faces and was like, oh my gosh oh my gosh, like it's real, <laughs> like it's real, or at least there's a really big possibility. Um, it's amazing. The work that they're doing and the time that they put into thing, the, into everything, the people that they have out there, 
putting that time in like Shane's out there all the time the poor, I was gonna say the poor guy but I'm kind of jealous but he really is boots on the ground and trying to collect that evidence it's just amazing what they're doing and just even to be a slight part of that you know um I've been out there hiking and camping out where this um where their headquarters are and stuff it's beautiful if I win the lottery I'm going to move out there but it's just beautiful yeah and Shane's episode has not aired I haven't edited that yet. okay you're, you're kind okay. of getting a scoop you, you you may actually air after his episode but it's it's always fascinating to me to to get that perspective from somebody like Shane is like you said he's been in it they've been doing this project for quite some time and it's always interesting to me to get a perspective for somebody who's seeing it for the first time sort of recently. And I certainly want to move into Project Blue Zoo Book and talk a little bit about that project. But it's interesting to me, the evidence. And I want to talk a little bit about what you think about the evidence. And I I talked to Les Stroud about this recently, and I, I, I made the comment to him, why do we not have more evidence? And of course, his retort to that was, what more do you want? Right. Evidence, right. Like what more do you want? And I've, I've said that in the past with, with people I've had on the show, it's, we have a ton of evidence. We have the Patterson Gimlin film. We have video, we have footprints, we have cast, we have, um, I talked to Tom Shea recently and Tom's done a ton of casting, right. And he's got yeah. these new telecasts where you have the, the dermal ridges and the, the things that you can, you just really can't fake. I mean, I guess you could right. fake it, but who's going to do Very that? hard, very hard right. to fake And I guess at the end of the day, what I was talking about is that just that definitive proof that these things are real. Because yeah. I seek that every day and people have asked me, well, what are you going to do when they say they're real? Well, I think that's when the real work begins, right? Because we have to study them. And so... I guess my question to you is, what do you think about the evidence as it stands now? What is the most compelling evidence to you? What is the thing that maybe has convinced you the most? Maybe it's the nest at the Olympic project site or something else that you've seen, maybe the Patterson Gimlin film or whatever, but where do you think we are on the evidence and, and why do you think we haven't been able to just get that definitive proof at this point beyond a shadow of a doubt that these things exist? Oh boy, there's a lot there. Um, personally, for me personally, just Amy Boo, personally, I think I am going to need to see one like right there, you know, like for me, a film or a picture or anything like that, I'll probably still always have a doubt. Just, it's just how I am. Whether or not I should have a doubt is up for debate, but it's just how I am. Um, I think science is going to need a body. I don't want to be the one to bring in the body. You know, that's not what I'm out there for. Um, but I think, I just think they're going to need one. But that, that being said, maybe science is going to need a body to 100% prove it. People often tell me, or I'll see it out on Bigfoot groups on Facebook or wherever at conferences, whatever, you know, oh, science isn't interested. Science isn't interested. And I have got to say, that's not true. That is not my experience anyway. When I started this project, I was shocked that scientists were interested. So I guess I felt the same way. But I will tell you that we have not had one scientist that has joined one of our meetings that didn't want to come back. They are, a lot of them are very fascinated with the topic. Doesn't mean they're convinced, but they are into it. And the problem is twofold when you come to science, the, as I see it. First of all, just because a um, zoologist or a wildlife biologist or whoever is looking into this is interested doesn't mean whoever's paying their salary is interested. <laughs> so we have a lot of scientists that are in what I call the Bigfoot closet. So they will be very open and talking about it to the rest of the group or other people, but won't come out publicly and they they just don't want to lose their job you know because you know um the olympic project and project zoo book we talk about a lot that we want to kind of carry the torch for dr bender noggle who wanted the you know topic of bigfoot to be less taboo which is what shane always says and, and i've kind of started saying that too 
to be able to just talk about it in the open and not be ridiculed and not be worried about your job. But, you know, if you're a primate person at a zoo, your curator might not like that. (laughs) They might be like, you're crazy because they haven't looked at all the evidence or potential evidence. Most people, when they will talk to me just casually, or if they are a guest for Project Zoo Book, they will say, I had no idea. I had no idea about all the footprint evidence, the audio, um, the witness reports. If if you're just talking to the average person in the United States, they haven't looked into it. You know, they really haven't. And once they do, and I, whenever I get like a really cool new scientist, I always want Shane to tell about the nest, tell about the nest, because yeah, to me personally, that nest site and just how it came about, um, what they found and everything is a really compelling piece of evidence. I also love the audio. I'm on my, all about the audio. Um, when you take audio that comes from an area where there's also footprints and there's also eyewitness reports and hair samples or whatever it is. And then you dump it into, you know, into a program that will tell you, okay, this is not something that we have, you know, found before or the McCulley Library of Sounds, you know, you can't find it anywhere else. Now, I'm not saying it's Bigfoot because if I didn't see Bigfoot making that sound, I'm just not going to say that. But come on now, like if you have all of that other potential evidence and then you have these sounds, you know, that are being heard in these, you know, areas where this activity is happening, it is very, very compelling to me. So that's what I am very interested in. Um, And the eyewitness reports, and I know, I know everybody says this, but it's true. You have all of these reports, thousands of reports coming from a lot of very normal people. And I don't know who the first person was to say it, but even if one of those reports is true, then Bigfoot is real, right? Like if one person that says they saw it up close and personal, if they're not lying, then it's real. You know, and I think about that on those days where I'm like, oh, why am I doing all this? And I'm like, you know, that keeps me going. That keeps me going because I don't think everybody's lying. And I totally agree. I, the, the audio has always been a big part for me because the, the problem with technology is that as technology has progressed over and over over the last few decades, it's so easy to fake. I do a UFO and a paranormal show in addition to the Sasquatch Odyssey. I do paranormal Odyssey. And I talk to people often that have had UFO encounters. And it's so easy nowadays to make a video look really compelling yeah. with a UFO. And, and it's the same thing with Bigfoot. And I've called hoaxers out on the past on my show. I, I, I despise hoaxers. Yeah, it it just sets us back so much when people are hoaxing so much evidence because the people with real evidence, and I think there's tons of people, I know there are tons of people out there who have very compelling evidence, and they just don't bring it forward. Mm-hmm. You know, it's me too. Me too. The next, yeah, the next Patterson Gimlin film beyond in HD is probably out there and we'll never see it. Or it may be 10, 15 years down the road before we see it because of the ridicule factor. But I say that often that the audio has always compelled me. I just did a, sto- uh, a show recently with David Ellis and Julie Ranch. And Julie's two hours away from me here in North Carolina. And some of the sounds that she played me we have heard on our property here. Wow. And it's been heard in the Pacific Northwest. It's been heard in British Columbia, Canada. Right. It's been recorded so many different places. And that's why I continue to do the show. Honestly, it's, it's one of the main reasons that drives me to do the show, because I think those anecdotal eyewitness accounts are just as important in all of this as the big picture as the footprints and the dermal ridges and all the things, the nest site. Nothing like too small to report. Absolutely. Because I talk to people over and over who have never talked to each other, of course, and they've never even had Bigfoot on the radar until they saw it. And they tell these minute details of what happened to them during their encounter and the way this thing moved or the things that it said or the vocalizations that it made rather. And the things that, they could 
I guess you could make it up if you're some sort of a, a an author of a novel, yeah. right? Yeah. But in general, a hunter who tells you these stories is not into Bigfoot, not making this up. Those anecdotal stories are very powerful in painting the total picture of what's going on around the country. And again, at the end of the day, five days out of seven, I think this is probably some sort of relic hominoid that's walking around that's undiscovered. But when I have those moments where, God, is that really possible? I look back at the stories and I think, mm. like you said, this man who is getting emotional about the story and the, the thing that he experienced, very much like you, I, talk, I say their stories, but their encounters, their experiences. And they tell their stories and they tell their experiences in that powerful, emotional place that it puts them. And I've, I've equated it to P PTSD in the past. I yes. think there's a lot of PTSD that goes on in these stories and I'm starting to ramble. So I'm going to get back on, on That's top. Okay. <laughs> People, my listeners are used to me rambling, but I want to get back to some of the evidence and let's talk about DNA for a second. I, I talked to Jeff Meldrum about this when I had Dr. Meldrum on the show and DNA and eDNA, have you had experiences with that? What do you think about some of the DNA evidence that's being collected? And do you think at the end of the day, maybe DNA might be enough to prove that these things are real? I think it will at least, um, you know, if they, if they follow the proper chain of command, if they follow the proper procedures, um, and you know, the Olympic Project is doing eDNA studies and DNA studies, you know, if those are done correctly and that can be proven that it's done correctly, at least it will definitely get the uh, attention of more people in the scientific community, right? Um, there's still going to be people that wonder if it's hoaxed or not. That's why I say I think we're going to need a body for 100%. But, you know, um, one of the things we talked about in my project early on were these other large primates that have pretty recently been either discovered or given credence by the Western scientific community when in Africa or in Asia, they already knew that they existed. So you had, you know, um, people in Africa that were saying the Billy Apes existed and that the Cross River gorillas existed, but, and even the Western lowland gorillas, you know, that there were way more of them than we originally thought after we knew they weren't cryptids um and western science was like nah, i don't think so nah, i don't think so until they were found you know and it could be something as simple as footprints or nest sites that got people interested in at least checking it out if they would have had dna then really you'd get more people going in there um but i can't remember where my train of thought was going but <laughs> ultimately it was going to the point that if that was happening in Asia with the, you know, orangutan that was recently, you know, over the last few years confirmed, um, and that was going on in Africa with larger primates that the natives were saying they were real and they weren't being listened to, I think that perhaps the same thing is happening in North America, because, you know, most of our tribes say that they're real or the first nations groups in canada say that they're real and they're not just a moral tale and they're not just a piece of mythology they're as real as a crow or an antelope and so i think that um a lot of the scientists i'm involved with look at those native tales and think hey maybe we're just not listening so I don't even know if I just answered your question or not, <laughs> but um, as far as the DNA, you know, I, I know that there's been other DNA that has been purported to be um, Bigfoot DNA, and I don't know whether it is or not, but I know there's also been questions about how it was collected and, you know, the chain of command and all that kind of stuff. So um, whether or not I think it's real has is neither here nor there. You know, I'm a, I'm a writer and English teacher, <laughs> you know, I'm not a scientist, but I think that we need to do better when it comes to really um, trying to prove that DNA is from a Sasquatch. I totally agree. And I think that 
there's a lot of things that have happened in the DNA that have sort of cast doubts. And I, I know Melba Ketchum, I've tried to get Dr. Ketchum on the show. She just doesn't want to talk about it. And I respect that. And I know yeah. that she's working on some other things and I have my opinions. Yeah. You know, people have torn that apart on both sides of the fence, you know, and there, there's those camps and there's always going to be those camps. Right. But right. I think at the end of the day, those camps you don't want to go in. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think at the end of the day, I think DNA is going to play a role in this, but I just don't know at this point what type of role. Yeah, I don't either. And definitely I, something. Yeah, right, right, exactly. And I, I definitely want to talk a little bit about the, the Project Zoo book, and we'll close out there. I want to be respectful of your time. But you mentioned cryptids and other cryptids. And I, I do, like I said, I do the Paranormal Odyssey show, and I've talked to people who have had dogman encounters, and I've talked to people who have seen Chupacabra. I have friends in the Bigfoot world, Jonathan Odom, my buddy in Alabama, who has seen little people in the woods while he's investigating and looking for Bigfoot. Just real quick, and it's it's certainly just a speculation and just an opinion, and that's all I'm looking for is your opinion. How do you feel like, or what do you feel that the other cryptids have done to either push the Bigfoot research forward, or do you think it sets it back, or do you think it makes it more of a laughing stock? What, what do you think about the other cryptids that are out there and what it's done for Bigfoot research? That's a really interesting question. I'll just say how I'm feeling right now, I guess, because I've never so much thought of it in that way before. Um, again, personally, I'm interested in Bigfoot as a possible primate or relic hominid or, you know, whatever. I don't want big, like Dogman to be real. <laughs> so if Dogman's real, I don't want to go out in the woods anymore. But I'm laughing, like nervous laughing more. I don't know. Like, I really don't know. I, you know, never say never, never say never. And, and even as an English teacher, like I love all those stories and things about fairies, and little people, all that stuff. Um, as far as whether it's kind of had a bad effect, I guess, you know, on Bigfoot. One of the things I will say, you know, if I do a talk at a library or conference or whatever, is that there's not thousands and thousands of reports about unicorns being real, you know, or leprechauns. I'm not saying they're not. I have no idea. I just, I've never looked into it. I just, to me, that would be less believable, you know, than a uh, ape out there. Um, but who's to say? I think that probably like you'll, you'll hear people talking about it. There was a news station in town that was talking about Bigfoot. We were doing a Bigfoot thing at another um, hunting show and they're like, oh, I think I saw a leprechaun, you know, ha ha ha. So I, th I think that it, to people who are not into Bigfoot, it probably like what they lump it all together, you know, and they're like, oh, those crazy dogman people or crazy Bigfoot people. But you know what? I don't really care. If you want to go try to find dog man, go try to find dog man and more power to you. I don't want to be with you <laughs> if you do find it. Um, I, you know, kind of like you said earlier, I, I want to know if they're real for myself. I also, since I've been getting more into the science end of things, I feel very strongly like if they are real, I want to help protect them. So there's that too. But, you know, ultimately if people aren't going to believe us or make fun of me I don't care I like really don't care and if somebody's passionate about dog man or little people then go for it I don't I don't I don't know it doesn't bother me it doesn't bother me if we if we have good evidence then we have good evidence and that shouldn't matter that was a very good answer and I'm sorry to put you on the spot but I'm just no, curious about it. yeah I like I like I like thinking <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's 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 certainly I've talked to so many people that have opened my mind to those different mm -hmm. things because dog man just doesn't compute for me. I yeah. Can't. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make like you could see a primate. You can't, I can't put that together. So if there is such a thing as dog man, I think it definitely is outside the normal. Right. And something scary. So that's why I don't want it to be real. <laughs> I, I am totally there with you. So let's, we've talked about it over and over and over again. So give us the lowdown on what Project Zoo Book is, how it came about, and what it is, and what it's currently doing. 
her. It's it's just the best. <laughs> it's the best, my opinion, of course. Um, the the short version is that I met this young lady through a Facebook group and she was wanting to join in on a Bigfoot expedition. And I wasn't putting the expedition on, but I was kind of helping with it. And so she had asked some questions and it, I didn't know if anybody had answered her. So I private messaged her and, you know, when you private message someone, you, you don't have to be their Facebook friends, so you know, nothing about them. And I was just like, Hey, did you get your questions answered? Blah, blah, blah. And she didn't, she didn't. So she was asking me stuff and, um, she didn't tell me anything about herself except that she and a group of coworkers were really interested in Bigfoot and they really wanted to go on an expedition. And she's like, yeah, they, we have this Bigfoot lunch club and every day at lunch, we talk about books we've read or we listen to podcasts together and read reports. And I was like, that's so fun. <laughs> like, I wish my coworkers would do that. <laughs> and so, um, it ended up that they couldn't go on that expedition, but I said to her, I'm like, listen, you know, it's not like really rocket science. I mean, we have different things we do or different methods people try, but it's really like camping with a purpose, right? So you're like hiking around looking for stuff. So I'm like, I'll take you and your coworker friends. If you really want to go, we'll just go. Like, you don't have to pay anything. You don't have to, you know, we'll just go camping where, where maybe we've had, there's been some sightings. So long story short, it ended up that she was not like a teacher in the teacher's lounge or librarian in the, their whatever librarian lounge or whatever at work. She was part of the primate department at a certain zoo. And I say certain zoo, cause again, they're in the Bigfoot class, <laughs> but it was the whole primate department there that was really interested in Bigfoot. And I, like after my jaw got back up off the floor, cause I'm not used to people like that taking any of it seriously. I'm like, really? Like, are you just, are you just like having fun? You think it's fun? She's like, no, like we're really interested because they would listen to Sasquatch Chronicles or different podcasts. And they'd be like, some of these witness reports sound very primate like, and some of the details they were saying weren't things that the lay person like myself would necessarily know, you know, they were catching all of these things. And so we started there and I'm like, okay, I'm Amy Boo from Ohio. I haven't been doing this that long. I've read a ton. I've taken a lot of reports, but I know there are people, even though I don't think there's any experts in Bigfooting, I know there are like audio experts or footprint experts or whatever. And so I'm like, I need to get these people to them. So our little, we called it Project Zoo Book. We were being silly because we were thinking, oh, like Project Blue Book, secret alien stuff, Project Zoo Book, secret Sasquatch stuff, you know, and we were just kind of kidding around. And then we're like, it turned into a legitimate little group. And um, I got the Olympic project who I was already friends with, you know, and we have a lot of crossover there for them to tell them about this because they'd never heard of the nest, you know, and then we started getting um, different people in the Bigfoot world to talk to them. Well, it wasn't long before we started getting more scientists involved. So my method of getting more scientists involved is just to, you know, I, I kind of just reach out to people. I'm just like, hey, you know, I'm going to go for it. Why not? I am not the brains behind Project Zoo Book. I am the coordinator of the smart people is what I call myself. So um, I'll just go to somebody, you know, whether it's a wildlife biologist or whatever, if I meet them or I hear about them or I'll email them and I'll be like, listen, you might think this is crazy, but I think science should harness the power of the Bigfooter because, you know, I'm besides being a teacher and a writer and Bigfoot enthusiast or whatever else I am, I'm also an Ohio certified volunteer naturalist. And I took those classes so that I would know what wasn't Bigfoot when I went out into the forests of North America and I continue to educate myself. And so I'm like, listen, we're out there you have this group of people who are really passionate about being out way far into the forest. And of course you don't, most Bigfoot sightings are road crosses, road, roadside crossings, right? So you don't have to go in there, but we like it. A lot of us like it. So um, I'll just say like, hook up with us. And maybe like, if you're looking for a certain kind of a bird or a certain kind of a fungus or a plant, you know, we'll look for it, you know, like use us to help you 
And then maybe you, you know, want to join us on a little Zoom call and they stay. They get really fascinated and they stay. And so we have at this point, it's been um, several years now, we have wildlife biologists and marine biologists. And um, we did one little Zoom about um, like sea, sea serpents and stuff. And I want to do that again. But we have um, an entomologist that came on, an evolutionary biologist, primatologist, anthropologist. Um, we have guests that come and leave. We have people that stay and it's just become like the most fun thing. It really has where, you know, we do this um, every other week. We have Zoom calls and we are trying to get together more in the field. We're trying to hook up scientists with researchers and doing micro studies. We have um, some different scientists that have hooked up with each other and they're doing like scholarly articles or they're doing mapping projects or whatever it is. And that just makes me so happy because all I ever wanted was people to take it seriously and to look into it. And, uh, you know, you said something earlier about this and I can't remember exactly how you put it, but I think about Peter Byrne and he's been doing this like his whole life and he has never seen one. And that could be me. You know, I've seen something twice and I've heard some things and had some different experiences, but never that smoking gun. But I don't really care. Like, I want to see one. I want them to be real. And I want them, you know, I want to know that. That's the truth. I want to. But if I don't, like, this is still fascinating. And, you know, we're out there doing this work, you know, that could bring, you know, what if the nest, the nest sites aren't Bigfoot, you know, it would be really disappointing, but what if they're not? It's still something new. It's still new animal behavior, whatever it is that's making them. And that's exciting. So, you know, Project Zubik, we call ourselves a think tank. We're doing a lot of exciting things. Um, if there are any people out there who are scientifically minded that want to get a hold of me, can I say my email address? Is that okay? Oh, absolutely. I was going to okay, add that before it's we It's easy. It's out. Bigfoot Amy, Bigfoot Amy, A M Y at gmail.com. But, you know, we just keep growing. And every time we do one of our Zoom meetings, you know, it's usually like we're, we're listening to whoever it is. And um, like last time, we just had somebody that presented about technology, different technology that's used out there. And so I'm like always messaging Tina or one of the other people. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. This is so interesting. I don't know what they're talking about, but it sounds really great. Like if if the, if Dr. Meldrum and the other anthropologists start talking half the time, I don't know what they're talking about, but I'm like, this sounds really cool. Uh, but they actually, they really do kind of dumb it down for people like me. Um, but it's just really exciting. It's exciting because for all those people out there that say that scientists is science is not interested in Bigfoot and there's nothing new going on and there's nobody, you know, that is really taking this seriously. Besides people like yourself, who I know are taking it seriously, I'm kind of like, oh, but we got our cool little thing going on here. Um, we are going to, we are working on a website where we're going to do like an ask the scientist type of a thing. Um, again, some people can can be out of that closet and some people can't. But it's just, hopefully you could tell my enthusiasm, it's just like the most fun thing ever. And you're welcome to come on one of the calls if you'd like sometime and kind of check us out. But it's, um, it's fun. It's fun. And when Bigfooting isn't fun for me anymore, I probably won't do it anymore. But I don't, I don't see that happening. I think it's absolutely, it's absolutely awesome, Amy. And I would love to come on a call. I think it would be fam fantastic. And anything I can do to promote it. I mean, this platform is great because there's so many people who listen to the show and they want new things, you know, yeah. they, they want yeah. to support new things. And anybody who's taking a scientific approach to this is in my book, doing it the right way. You know, that's one of the things I talk about Doug Highcheck. My friend, Doug Highcheck is, oh, I love him. One of those, Doug is one of those scientific minded yes. people who wakes up every day and usually finds more questions than he finds answers, but yes, I after getting fantastic. like two hours of sleep, <laughs> right? Because he's constantly doing things and thinking and it's, it's one of those things. And I love to have the ability to bounce things off of Doug. I, I send him things often and yes. say, Hey, what do you think about this? And he's a big part of project Zubuk now. 
you know, he's, he joined us uh, this past year. I met, I met him through some other people. And I, as an editor and writer, I was helping him write some things um, for his business. And then I'm like, Hey, maybe you want to, <laughs> maybe you want to come on here. Cause he's just so brilliant. And so, yeah, he's introduced us to new people. He's great. Love Doug. Yeah, he's fantastic. And he's one of the the people who suggests that I have you on the show. And I'm so glad oh, you did. Thanks, I, Doug. I, he's <laughs> awesome. I, I told I send him messages all the time. And I'm like, you got to listen to this week's show because we talked about you for like five minutes. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. I'm sure. No, he's amazing. He really, he's really, you know, he's out there doing it. You know, he's trying to find the evidence. Absolutely. Well, Amy, I have had a fantastic time talking to you. I thank you so much for your time. And wh where can people one more time, give us the email address where we can reach out to you. Sure. Bigfoot Amy. So A M Y at gmail.com. And I'm on Facebook, Amy Boo B U E and get a hold of me. But yeah, we're, we're always open for new scientists and stuff and different researchers. We're, we're kind of, we're kind of medium sized now. Like we, we, um, we we like it that we can all talk to each other and stuff, but we always welcome welcome new people. So yeah, get a hold of me. Awesome. Amy Boo, Project Zoo Book. Thank you so much. I've had a blast. It was great having you on the show. Thank you. It was really fun. Anything I can do for you, also let me know. Awesome. I appreciate it. Oh, that was awesome, Amy. I knew it would be. I've said to people in the past, it's like you, you see people online and you see them on documentaries and things, and you hope that they're the person that you think they are. I was like, I know Amy's going to be that person. You just so genuine. So I thank really, you. Appreciate. Thank you. I love your show. So I was very honored for you to ask me to be on it. I thank really you. appreciate it. Um, this will probably, I don't know. I'm probably 10 shows behind at this point. <laughs> <laughs> so no, but when i get me. it edited and 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 all ready to go i will definitely send you a message and i'd love for okay. you to share it on your social media and everything so. absolutely absolutely yep all right well i will definitely stay in touch and anything like i said anything i can do or or sure. whatever i can do to help promote the project zoo book i'll definitely thank you appreciate it i appreciate it thank you so much have a great night you too dear Tell your dog I said hi. I will. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.